Sometimes when I'm thinking about us Before we got lost and we parted Back to back we would carry on then We'd do anything for what we started But this time we could break Welcome everybody to the FPV News with JB and it's Blunty. How are you doing this week, Blunty? Good, Joshua. How's it going? I'm doing very well. I'm glad to be here with you and I'm glad to be here with you all to go over uh, the news of the week in the FPV world. Um, and we do have, uh, we've got some exciting uh, news items this week, Blunty. Uh, but I want to start, I'm going to just jump the line with a personal item that just happened. I just literally found out about this a couple hours ago. And that is that Flow State, the FPV drone documentary, you've, we've talked about it a lot. I think you guys know what it is, has been accepted to the first of the film. We've applied to many film festivals and has been accepted to the Falcon International Film Festival of London. Uh, I don't 100% know what that means in terms of your ability to see the film. Uh, but we have been accepted to a film festival! Yay! First of many, I hope. Yeah. Sorry, my nope. camera is freaking out. Oh, no. I know you're having trouble with USB. Uh, while you sort that out, I will take a minute to say hello to all the beautiful people in the chat. All the beautiful people in the chat. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Uh, oh, it means a lot. Wouldn't wouldn't have a live stream without you. Um, if you want to send us a message, uh, hit the dollar sign down here to leave a super chat. And of course, thank you as always to the patrons over on the right side of the screen here in my Discord server. You can join them by joining my Patreon link in the video description. Uh, just a couple bucks a month uh, or more if you feel like I've earned it. Uh, let's see if Blunty's got his camera. So, oh, there it is. He does. Yep. Good to go. Uh, <laughs> well, now that you're back, Blunty, why don't you tell us the other things that are on deck for this week? Uh, first of all, we should let people know we will not be here next week. 
Is that correct? Oh, damn. You're. Oh, thank you. You're right. I am going... Uh, well, I'm not going to Burning Man because Burning Man was canceled this year. And that's exactly why I'm going. Because I'm too good for Burning Man, but I'm not too good to go hang out on the playa when no one said I could be there. So uh, I will be gone next week. Hopefully I'll be back the week after and not like dead. Um, I yeah. hear that Lake Tahoe is kind of on fire, which is not that far from Reno, but yeah. Well, stay anyway. safe. Have fun. Thank you. Uh, yep. In the, in, in, not necessarily in that order, but uh, yes. we, we will be off the air this coming Tuesday and uh, then uh, hopefully back the Tuesday after. Thanks for bringing that. What else we got? Cool. All right. So this week, we're going to talk about the GoPro Hero 10 Black is leaked. And we'll go over that, some picks and some information. Um, we'll talk about the BL Heli beta for 32.8.2. Finally, we've got what we've been asking for. We've got control by RPM for dynamic PWM. Uh, we've also got Real Steady 2.0 uh, teased in a survey. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that and look at what the survey says. Lance, uh, the place you report your flights and get approval, is currently out as of about an hour ago. Um, that's the second outage, so we've had in like a month or so. Yeah. So for those um, who fly legally, screw you. Yeah, pretty much. Um, Walmart uh, has decided to bet on drone delivery. Um, maybe they're like pretty likely to make it feasible. We'll take a look at that. Um, I have made a GitHub wiki page for new pilots, for new FPV pilots. We'll take a look at that. And uh, maybe you can help out if you're interested. Exciting. We've got a telemetry bug fix uh, for the RadioMaster TX12 and T8 Pro. So if you need help with that, uh, we'll have your information. We've got a new program called Fly Me to the Moon, which is a Lua toolbox app that we'll take a look at. Um, We've got another SRT tool. We've taken a look at quite a few SRT tools that you requested a while back, and now we'll take another look at another one that's uh, now come public. Hmm. Uh, Halo RC now has a U.S. warehouse. We just want to shout them out because you can buy Halo RC in the U.S. now. Yeah, really good frames. We'll take a look at that. Yeah, uh, folding TPU receiver uh, has been updated uh, by Ridwan Hughes, licensed to drive, and he's got the EP2 now. So those are pretty cool. We'll take a quick look at those. And then we've got a special thing. I don't think we've ever had this before on the show. We've got a double rant. Double rant. Double That's rant. right. <laughs> and we've got a JB rant, and we've got a Blunty rant. So yep, yep. Stick around. We were, t we were talking about your rant, and I started my own rant, and I was like, "Hey, let's just double it up." So yeah, yeah. Kind of PV. Thank you for asking. When do we all get to watch Flow State? Uh, I've, I've talked about this before. I don't want to bore people who've heard it, but the bottom line is, as soon as Netflix gives us a zillion dollars. Boom, you get to watch it. That's the short version. We're trying to sell it. We're trying to sell the film. Um, we are in talks with someone who might represent the film as an agent and try and get it in front of people who could want to pay us for it. And uh, in addition, we started the process of getting our errors and omissions insurance, which I didn't know about what that was until I got in, started making a film. But apparently it is a thing you need before you can sell your film. So soon, right. so we'll do our best. Doing our yeah. best to get it out to you, uh, but let's start off plenty with the the, the uh, probably the most uh, the biggest news this week is the leak of the GoPro Hero Ten Black, and what does it mean for FPV? Every time a new GoPro comes out, we have to ask, you know, has it gotten better or worse for FPV? That's the question. Yeah, do unfortunately, um, I don't have. I wasn't able to get any like one who could give me a weight. Like I, I, I know people with it. I was not able to get a weight. Um, however, we've gotten everything else. From what I've heard, it's very similar to the Hero 9 Black, but we've got an upgraded sensor inside um, and a new processor. So that's our main difference here. Um, mm -hmm. So specs are gonna be 5.3K60, 4K120. Mm. That's respectable. Um, yeah, quite a big step up from the Hero 9 Black. And then that sensor is going to be 23 megapixels instead of 20 megapixels. So a little um, bit higher resolution sensor. Uh, yes. Not always a good thing because higher resolution can mean more noise or can mean less light sensitivity. But probably GoPro's done a pretty good job here. And then the upgraded yes. processor is, I think, what people are most excited about because it gets them, uh, it gets them higher uh, frame rate 4K, basically. Yes. Yeah, so 4K yeah. 120, and then that'll also mean a 2.7K 240, if you like mm. shooting 240. Mm. 
that's that's something. Yeah, I think for FPV, uh, somewhere up to maybe 240. Like I've shot at 240 before and done slow mo, and thought that it was looked pretty good. It feels like much past about 240 is pretty specialized uh, in terms of FPV. You're just going so slow. Uh, yeah. So I think 2.7K 240 is pretty pretty sweet spot right there for people who want to do slow mo. Size yep. and weight looks looks similar to the nine, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks similar to the nine from the specs we know and the attitudes and stuff. Hopefully, it'll be very similar weight, but I don't think anybody's been able to confirm that weight yet. Um, and then also, um, uh, yeah, just like comparing to the Hero Nine Black, I think like it's a step up, but I don't know how big of a step up it is. And I think the big thing will depend on like where the Hero Nine Black price ends up when this comes out, and then where this right. price ends up. Like, so if this is four hundred and the Hero Nine drops like fifty or hundred bucks. Um, I think the Hero 9 might be pretty appealing for people at the same weight. Um, this is a big step up in quality, though. So yeah, yeah it'll just depend. I I, I always am at least one generation behind on my GoPro strictly because of cost. Like, I literally don't own a Hero 9. Uh, I have one Hero 8 that I almost never fly, and almost all of my flight cameras are Hero 7s because um, you get them for about 200 250 bucks, and I just feel like I get what I need from them. Here, granted, the 8 and the 9 do look better. I just can't bring myself to fly them, especially the weight of the nine is so much higher yeah. than that of an eight or, or especially a seven. Now, this is not in the news, um, but wasn't there also a leak of like a new session style camera? There was like a single sentence uttered that they were possibly testing it. And then I've talked to multiple people who are in possession of a Hero 10 and they said a session is not real. So mm. I don't know if they know or not, but like... Everything I mean, I've heard is like that is a total false rumor and that session is not coming. So they well, might have tested be, one internally, but like, yeah. yeah. It wouldn't be the first it, time that there had been rumors of a session, a new session that turned out to be false. Um, but you're saying that you know people who are in GoPro's beta test program. They have Hero 10s yeah. in their hands and they're and they saying don't have a there's session. no. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like it's not good. Damn. Yeah. Also, if I you mean, look at like the history of GoPro's like cameras, like, it would be. It seems to me to be odd from the way they've aligned things to step back to the session, um, unless they yeah. were like, yeah, I, don't, I just can't see that um, angle for GoPro because I'm not sure where the market is for GoPro. Exactly. If you look at the and this is kind of what I was hinting at at the beginning of the segment, which is, GoPro seems like they have moved further and further away from the FPV market. Now, I, I think that. For the, for the most part, they don't know the FPV market exists. I know there's specific people in GoPro who know FPV pilots, but GoPro corporate, big GoPro, they don't, we're, we're a tiny dot on the, their radar, if at all. But they're, they've been moving towards bigger cameras. The GoPro 9 got a front screen, which is more breakable. They've just been moving away from what we want. So I just don't see us them going back to a session. It'd be great if they did. Yeah. Yeah, I think unfortunately we have to look to other places for that. Um, like what? And then also, well, just like, you know, we've got Runcam. Hopefully, maybe they'll make a new. Uh, so the Runcam final word is horrible. Hopefully, we'll see, you know, uh, some companies like that push push in that direction in the future. The so. new Go, it obviously Go, doesn't compare to like a GoPro. No, the new Go camera or the Firefly camera that we talked about in the new product roundup uh, yeah. has some maybe Insta360, some potential. Right. Mm. Also, uh, just quick information. There's like a leak out right now for the, there's some kind of five high five ad. That's just a tease for the Osmo mobile five. It's like a gimbal. Don't worry. Mm. It's not, it's not, uh, mm. the FPV related. I've seen a lot of rumors today. So just wanted to okay. say. All right. Well, uh, hero 10, uh, I'm excited about it. If only cause it'll drive the price of the other ones down. And yep. eventually I'll be shifting probably to hero eights and stay two generations behind. But in the meantime, uh, remember, you can always run a Hero 9 or 10 with the battery removed yes. uh, and power it via USB, like off your balance connector. iFlight makes an adapter to do that, and it'll save you. What is it? It's like 50 grams for the battery, isn't it? It's a decent amount. Yeah, it's like 30 to 40 maybe. I don't know. I haven't checked it on yet. It's, quite it's a not bit. as much as 50, but it's something. Yeah. Uh, thanks, GoPro. All yeah. right. Well... From a from a, a big splashy news item to something a little more technical, uh, Blunty, you you uh, brought this up. Beta, BL Heli Beta 32.8.2, so this is not released yet, has added 
dynamic PWM frequency. Now, I thought that BLHeli 32.8 already had dynamic, uh, dynamic PWM frequency. So what's different here? Yeah, so this is something we've discussed a little bit in the past, but basically uh, one of the biggest issues a lot of people have had with the implementation of BLHeli 32's uh, PWM frequency, their dynamic, is when you set the low and the high, essentially there's just a linear path between the low and the high. So like halfway through the throttle, you're at 36K if your bottom is 24K and your top is 48K. And mm -hmm. so for, for many, for some builds, that's not going to be a problem. For other builds, you know, um, you're going to hit harmonics. And so the, the issue was like, hey, we want to avoid those harmonics. So um, AM32 has been doing this for a little while, and now BLHeli32 has decided to also implement this feature in 32.8.2 called by RPM. And essentially, it's going to take your ERPM inside of the motor and then compare that, uh, that, that commutation frequency to the PWM frequency. And then mm -hmm. it's going to decide if there's a harmonic issue there, and it's going to avoid that harmonic issue internally. And AM32, in case people uh, don't watch every single video I ever put out, AM32 is an open source ESC firmware developed literally just this guy. I think his name was Pete. Uh, I don't remember his last name. He just sat down one day and went, oh, I think I'll make an ESC. And then two years later, he had he had developed this firmware that runs on BLHeli 32 ESCs. And he came yeah. up with the idea to do variable PWM frequency based on the motor RPM. The, the idea being that you're going to make the motor PWM frequency avoid the harmonics of the RPM, which could cause things like mid-throttle oscillation and other problems. But here's the thing that confused me about what BLHeli 32 is doing. I thought it was based on the motor RPM because that kind of makes sense. But you're saying it's not. It's based on the ERPM, which is it's the number of times they're commutating the poles. And I don't see yeah, how so that'll avoid the harmonics. Um, I guess apparently uh, from the small bit I've been able to dig into it, the issue is an electrical harmonic. So what's happening is like, because the ESC is commutating the motor at a certain frequency, right? It's going around and around the, the motor. It, that's mm -hmm. what the ERPM is showing us, right? The commutation right. rate. Mm -hmm. um, if you compare that rate to the, the dynamic PWM frequency rate, you can catch where they would somehow match up. So like as you're so, firing that PWM and you're commutating around the motor, there's right. like if it, if it falls together, I guess, that's where you end up with these harmonic resonances. So the issue is that is that you've got magnets going around the, you've got magnets on the, on the bell and you've got the stator poles and you're, the ESC is commutating to, to spin the motor. And the actual RPM of the motor depends on the size of the bell and the number of magnets. If it has 12 magnets, then you're going to commutate so many times, you have more or fewer magnets. But what you're saying is that it's not the physical vibration of the motor, the actual RPM of the motor that creates the harmonic problems. It's the relationship between the PWM and the commutation rate. Which yeah, the electrical that's... commutation frequency, I think, is what uh, that's hmm. the Skogs, that uh, guy had and head of BLHeli 32. Um, yeah, I think he said it's the electrical commutation frequency versus the electrical well, PWM frequency. He would know, but yes. I was surprised to learn that because in AM32 firmware, they have you put in the number of poles of your motor so that the firmware can calculate the actual RPM, not the ERPM. And I assumed they were basing the PWM frequency on the motor RPM. But um, what you found out was that that's not true. Correct. Yeah. Even though we put magnets into AM32, like we put a magnet count into AM32 and it gets an RPM, it's actually using that RPM for startup power and minimum RPM protection. It's not using that uh, for, um, yeah, for this the, variable the, the, PWM. Instead, it's using ERPM. It doesn't need RPM. So, yeah, yeah. just kind of like a misconception. But, yeah, it, it ends up being uh, yeah, helpful to everybody. So hopefully this test code will come out of test code pretty soon, but if you're okay with using test code, this seems like the way to do dynamic PWM if you're on BLHeli 32. Yeah. Well, and uh, when, when BLHeli 32 version 32.8 first came out with variable PWM frequency, there were problems. Some people got like super hot motors or other problems yes. when using variable. And I thought that was because of the way they were doing the variable PWM, but it turns out uh, it's not because it's, it was just because there was a bug in 32.8. Um, but, um, now hopefully we're going to get even better variable PWM frequency. You know, you know, the promise of variable PWM frequency will finally be realized. I guess we'll see.
Yeah, there's some other cool features in here, just like just to mention real quick. Um, they found ways to reduce noise levels for D shot, so they've got um, better dynamic filtering. Um, uh, basically, uh, they've also got a new feature called Very High for DMAG compensation. So if you've been putting it to high, you've still been getting DMAGs, it's possible that uh, this will fix some motors with really long DMAG times. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of neat. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, just some stall protection stuff and um, on adaptive low RPM power protect stuff. So just a little, little bit extra features, but I think the big ones are that by RPM and then possibly that very high DMAG compensation. I'm interested to see how that works out. Yeah. Yeah. Omar Hughes asks, does variable PWM adjust PWM for motors in the middle of flip when motors are saturated? Um, Omar, the variable PWM would be based on the motor, basically the throttle position, but actually uh, it wouldn't be the throttle position. It would be the no. actual speed the motor is spinning at. So the motor may be saturated at full throttle, but based on the airflow going through the motor, the motor RPM may be different and the variable PWM would adjust based on the RPM. That's the bottom line. Yeah, I think basically it'll be, I think it's still linear based on motor output. So if you like at 50% motor output, you'll be in the center of your PWM range, unless that would hit a harmonic with your ERPMs and then it'll be variable well, how, inside how does, of that. that uh, how does, and we don't, we don't know the answer, but I got to ask anyway, how does the ESC know what the top of the ERPM range is? Like when the oh, ESC goes to- on, Motor output. That's what I'm saying. I think it's still linear based on motor output, but once it's at a certain point, it's like deciding not to stay there. It's like floating around that spot based on ERPM not to hit that, like uh, that. Uh, what do you call it? The harmonic. Harmonic. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, but I don't it, think. <laughs> I'll say one of the other things here is um, this being BL Holly 32. It is difficult mm -hmm. to get information because it's closed source. So. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Best we can do. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well. We'll try it out and we'll see if it works good. That's yeah. the bottom line. Thank you to the BL Holly 32 dev, uh, devs, dev, devs, mostly devs, dev, I think. Yeah. Uh, and uh, thanks to them for the work they're doing. Uh, next up, Blunty, what do we got? All right. So the next up we've got um, Real Steady has put out a survey. Um, and that survey is teasing new features and asking you what you'd pay for them. So. Hmm. What would you pay for these? Uh, Real Steady, basically they've sent this, this is like a, hey, if you saw this, what would you pay for it? Is kind of how they present it to you. Um, so this is like, uh, presumably, what Real Steady Go 2.0 will have in it. So we'll get real-time playback of video, we'll get uh, you know support for all shooting modes, we'll get batch processing and a couple other things. And they're actually asking people starting at $110 and going down in increments, what mm -hmm. you would pay uh, for these features. Isn't it normally, eight, what is it normally, $80, $90? I think 90 I, think that's I can't remember last time. I did buy it. I can't remember what I paid for it. Um, it goes on sale sometimes for a little lower. Um, I mean, I, I have tried to do a uh, real steady go on hypersmooth stabilized footage for whatever reason when it was recorded, hypersmooth was on and it won't do it. And that was a little annoying because I wanted it to be like a little more stabilized. So, I mean, that would be nice. And I don't really understand why they won't do it, but presumably they have a good reason. Batch processing. I don't, I'm not sure about batch processing. I think if you're doing real steady on your footage, like probably you, the reason you're doing real steady is you want to be able to tweak it to make yeah. sure it looks good and check it out. And like, especially if you're a pro doing Cinewhoop stuff, you, you're not going to just batch process it and send it to your customer. So I'm not sure how much benefit there is there. Yeah. I'm not sure either. I'm not, a, I've never used real steady go. Um, I'm not a real steady kind of guy. Um, yeah. so yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure how much, I guess that's kind of why they're teasing this, right? Is they're kind of right. like letting people all like say, how much would you actually pay for this? Um, and it seems like it's going to be an add on. Um, I don't know the way they're asking is like how much, essentially how much more would you pay? So it seems like they're saying like, Hey, would you pay 50 on top of the 99 you already paid? Mm. Like, for, I don't know for about that. that. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Mo said Mo in the Discord would love to see Real Steady Go on mobile. Yeah, that would be it. Would be nice to see a mobile app. That's that's definitely something yeah. you could do. Um, I was thinking there's another thing that I I what, what about the ability to do like software filtering of the gyro data for those cameras that don't work? Um, isn't it seems like if you have to soft mount a camera, like isn't the Hero Eight one of the ones you have to soft mount? Is that right? 
think that's correct. I'm not sure offhand. All right, we're not 100 percent sure, but like there's yeah. cameras like maybe the Hero Eight or the Hero Six that you have to soft mount because the gyro that data that comes out of them is too noisy and Real City Go can't work with it. Well, soft mounting is basically just putting a low pass filter on the a mechanical low pass filter. And do you know if the GyroFlow open source project can handle that gyro data and like in software low pass it and make it work? Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I do believe that it can basically use any of that data. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I can't speak on that for sure. I would pay for that. I mean, I don't know why they, I, I understand why the data doesn't work but it seems like it should be possible to run it through some kind of a filter and make it work. And I'm surprised they're not putting more effort into that. Do you think there's a reason why they haven't like updated the firmware with that low pass filter? So it just isn't there. Like the GoPro firmware. Yeah. Why GoPro hasn't done that. Yeah. Cause it's like, there's like, cause Go GoPro owns real study now. Right. So it's like, it's all inside the house. Right. Oh, you're right. I forgot about that entirely. Yeah. Um, Elvin, Elvin says, uh, why it won't do it. GoPro meta, I guess, I think he means, uh, hyper smooth, uh, stabilization. GoPro metadata doesn't contain information about how the in-body stabil stabilization is applied. Oh, I see. So it, it, the gyro data wouldn't match the motion when you run hyper smooth, the gyro data that's recorded doesn't match the motion of the frame of the image anymore. And so you can't apply stabilization after yeah. the fact that's interesting essentially essentially you need like a log in there that says like how it what it did to the footage right yeah mm, mo says the session five and the hero seven have to be soft mounted are you sure about that mo i thought the seven was one of the good ones but i would have to check I, i'm not sure i'd have to check maybe we should check um the other thing uh the other thing so you were saying, why don't they put out a firmware that fixes that gyro data problem? That's a good point. Although I'm not surprised to hear that GoPro isn't like in a big hurry to release new weird firmware for their old cameras. So, yeah, I would hope that any cameras going forward would be compatible since like you say, GoPro owns real steady go now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, drone pilot says low pass filter is in the form of silicon tube, seven millimeter outside diameter, three millimeter inside diameter vacuum tube. Yeah, exactly. But if you can low pass with hardware, then you should be able to low pass with software as well. And I reckon, I don't know what frequency real steady go needs. Like if you're talking about stabilizing quadcopter movements, I'll bet it's less than certainly less than 20 or 50 Hertz. If you're talking about get, stabilizing like jello, that's a little different, but I don't know if real steady go stabilizes like jello i'm not sure so i i wish they would filter it in software i guess is the takeaway uh elvin that says uh, he's a gyro flow dev filtering has been attempted it seems like a hardware aliasing issue so maybe it's not as simple as i'm making it out to be interesting uh, curtis campbell says the latest gyro flow beta does have a low pass filter but it seems like elvin is saying it doesn't necessarily work as well as you'd hope there you go um all right all right well, go tell GoPro how much you would pay for a new real steady. Yeah. Uh, next up, we got a quick item. Just a quick item. Uh, <laughs> surprise! Lance is down. Yep. So, so far, is... we're about we're about two hours into a partial outage of Lance. The FAA is aware. We're working on it. But last time, it was a few days. So, mm -hmm. possibly buckle up. We don't really know what's wrong. <laughs> and this basically only matters if you're a professional. Uh, if you have a shoot tomorrow and you need yep. to get Lance approval for your shoot, uh, especially if you fly DJI drones that will not take off in certain conditions without permission, uh, you are boned. Good luck. Uh, I don't Pretty really much. know if there's a workaround. Is, are, are you just boned? Your drone won't fly? Yeah. I yeah, I think previously they were doing manual stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it won't fly, but I know like, um, like the DJI FPV drone for sure has a uh has like a patch you can use for nfc like to take off when you're not supposed to mm -hmm. um, and i'm sure the other drones have that too so like if you're really i would say if you're a person who's doing this for a living and making thousands of dollars off dji drones mm -hmm. you should have drone hacks installed and you should be able to bypass an nfc <laughs> yeah. that's gonna be and my hot tip <laughs> if you have a job tomorrow you should be downloading drone hacks right now uh, yeah. But obviously, if you have self-built drones, uh, you still may be legally required to get Lance approval. But if the yeah. Lance is down and you just go, uh, F it, I'm going to try and you know, finish my job, 
that's on you and you can work around it. So, yeah. well, hopefully it'll be back up by next week. <laughs> Thank you, John Larson, for your $10 super chat. Uh, John's leaving. Got to go. So I'll go ahead and read it off real quick. Love the news with JB and it's blunty. Like, and I subscribe to help out with the algorithm. Thank you very much, John Larson, for the super chat. Um, all right. Well, uh, Lance isn't working. Uh, and last week we talked about how Amazon and I think it was DHL have both basically said they're giving up on their drone delivery plans, to which yeah. a whole bunch of people went, of course, how was that ever going to work? But apparently Walmart has not given up. They're going to try yeah, to make so it work. Yeah, Walmart is diving in when everybody else is diving out pretty much. Um, a couple of months ago, they basically invested in drone up. Um, and it looks like um, this is going to be their feature plan. So, you know, everybody else is saying like, hey, it's so far, you know, these drones have to deliver from these central warehouses and what's their flight times and stuff. And Walmart's like, we got stores everywhere. That so is true. That why is don't we true. just bring it from the store that's within eight miles, 10 miles of every single customer that we have? Oh, just um, eight of, or 10 miles. So easy to fly a drone that far. Sure. It is still pretty interesting, though. Um, yeah, the... If you look at what, what Amazon would have to do to be within 10 miles of 90% of their customers, it's a, you know, that's, that's a big step. And Walmart is already there. So it's, um, it's so, true. That, that's a good point. I, yeah. I still think, I mean, like, look at this picture. Look at this picture. Hang on. We'll go back up. This is their sort of fantasy of how it might work. Okay. So this is like a best case scenario. Like that's a, that's a big drone. What's, what's the range of that drone? I mean, if you assume it has LiPo batteries, maybe it's got a 20 or 30, maybe a 40 minute flight time, right? Yeah, not yeah, more than that, like right? No, not more than that. Okay. So here we've got a, let's say it's a $10,000 drone, conservative. I think that's, that's, that's ballpark, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. And it's got a 40 minute, let's say maybe an hour flight time. So, like, what's the delivery range? How far? I mean, could it fly? I guess, it, I mean, if it could fly 20 miles an hour, which is not that fast, actually, maybe you could deliver within a five or 10 mile radius. Uh, yeah, and basically but, they're talking about, um, they also made an investment in this company, Cruise, which is autonomous vehicles. And they're basically talking about having a fleet where they're like, some deliveries would be done with drones, some deliveries would be done with autom autonomous vehicles, and then everything would be delivering, you know, be delivered autonomously. So I don't know. It's interesting. I think if you look at these other companies who are trying to do this, um, you know, if you think about DHL trying to deliver packages with drones, I don't know that that ever would be feasible. Yeah, because um, like they've got like... At a, They've got like one warehouse. They've got a like a warehouse at the airport, maybe, and then like a yeah. distribution center. Like I've had to pick packages up from a FedEx or a UPS distribution center. And I mean, obviously, there's more than one in each city, but there's not as many of them as there are Walmarts. Sure. Not even close. Are there? Yeah. Yeah. No. So, um, yeah, I don't know. This is I think this is interesting. I think um, if you look at the different options for for companies and what they could do there's there's not a lot of other people positioned like this so if somebody is going to be able to handle this and drone up has anywhere near close to the right technology then i think walmart has some you know some option for this maybe it's only like who knows like pharmacy deliveries for old people or like, right yeah, i think i, I think that's know. the next thing you have to ask is at what cost right sure um because Anytime you've got a situation where your package is being hand delivered by one guy and that's all they're doing, the cost goes way up. Uh, so I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. I, I'm, st I, I'm still iffy on it. Sure. So. No, I think that's totally understandable for sure. Um, if Amazon's iffy on stuff, I think most people should be iffy on it. That's for sure. Because if Amazon yeah. can't handle like rolling something out, you know. Yeah, I mean, but, I I, th I, what I thought this is never going to work, but if anybody could pull it off, I guess it's Amazon. And Amazon was like, actually, no. Um, so Google is still technically in it. Maybe they'll pull it off. Google is no. Google is famous for abandoning projects. I'm surprised they still they haven't. Nah, we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> anyway, uh, all right. Good luck, Walmart. Hmm. Um, right. what's next, Blunty? So I have made a new little website here just because I was 
frustrated by student questions and you know as as we do uh, tried to solve them so uh i found i made this little website you can reach it at newfpvpilot.com and mm -hmm. essentially um i thought it would be important uh to start listing things that it makes sense for a new pilot to learn so like hey i'm a brand new pilot and there's like 20,000 videos about FPV or whatever, you know, some ridiculous amount of videos and you type FPV and you get pages and pages and pages. So like, what should I be doing? You know, how should I be doing it? And what should I be learning? So this all kind of stemmed from somebody who asked me, like, who was mentioning that they didn't set up RPM filtering because it seemed complicated and they weren't really sure if it was worth it. And so to me, I thought it was important to find a way to tell people like, hey, stuff like RPM filtering is super worth it. It doesn't take long to set up. Um, and some hardware may work out of the box. Um, but other things may take a long time to set up or be difficult. And maybe you don't want to do that. So my hope was maybe to find a way to uh, point people in the right direction. This is really great, Blinty. Uh, I think um, like people have sometimes asked me, I wish there was a better way to organize your videos than just having to do like web searches. Um, and the problem is the information moves really quickly. And so like to sit down and make a course, like the guys over at FPV Unlocked made a course. I am in awe of the amount of work it's going to take them to keep up yes. as things move forward, but hopefully they're up to it. I mean, yeah, um, but, the, like the, some of the crossfire stuff is already behind. Maybe it doesn't even have tracer. Like there's so many pieces of this. Yeah. So, but having a wiki where you pull in the latest information from other resources seems like yeah. it's actually a sweet spot because with a wiki you can have multiple co contributors, right? So that people yes. can have edit permission, um, and you can just as new information comes out, kind of pull it in and keep this. Uh, I'm really excited to see how this grows. Yeah. So my main goal with this is just like, like kind of like you said, aggregation. Like, you know, my goal is to aggregate all the good stuff here. So you could just click on a thing and you figure it all out. And if you have any questions, hopefully they're answered within that. I don't want to make this, like you said, I don't want to make this like a bunch of written guides that people spend time to build. If you want to yeah. make a written guide, make it off site and then we'll link to it. <laughs> we'll link and to then it. I, yeah. It's super easy that way. And then it doesn't like suddenly get old um, or it doesn't get as old as it would if you've got specific guides here. So Let's... also... This yeah. is my list. Uh, everybody's list is going to be different. This is a little bit biased for me. Like, I'm not going to remove the get off free, free sky early because I think that's super important. <laughs> but if you have some suggestions here, want to change things or add anything, you're welcome to push a PR for that or get with me and I can give you edit permission um, mm -hmm. and we can get working on it. But yeah, I'm just slowly adding to it, tacking in some extra articles, and hopefully this is helpful to somebody um, uh, when they start flying. And this is this is even it's interesting that you chose GitHub, although I think it was a great decision because a lot of people think of GitHub as a, uh, the home of like source code for programs. But GitHub is just a versioning system. And in this case, you're using it to store, you know, is there there isn't even any code is there? There's just a read me. Nope, yeah, just read me a contribution guide. And, and then uh, a wiki. And the wiki, yep. and the wiki is really uh, where the resources are. Yep, and that way somebody could also like pull the wiki if they wanted to make their own wiki or like you know like it's all there, so it's super easy to Great. deal with them. Great. Yeah. Crunk says he wants to put Kiss flies better than Beta Flight at the very top. <laughs> <laughs> and that's something I would not accept. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Um, well, he could just clone your. He could just clone, right? Or fork. Yes, exactly. He can. He, he can start just his fork own. your wiki and change it. <laughs> exactly. Oh my God. Um, but something else I thought this might be interesting for is identifying where there is a lack of information. So one mm -hmm. thing I noticed is like, I haven't found a good video talking and explaining three-stage arming. I know you've mentioned it in multiple videos, but like yeah. I haven't seen a good single video that discusses like, here's what three-stage arming means. There's a pre-arm, an arm, and you move your throttle up. And like, um, yeah, I don't, maybe a concise explanation of that would be good. So hopefully as yeah. we fill this out, we'll get like a list of things that people can help with. And well, if I'd you love make to help, video, obviously. We'll, yeah. we'll tack it on, so. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, thank you, Plenty. Thanks for taking the initiative there. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, great resource. It's linked down below in the show notes with yes. all the other uh, stuff that we've linked. So, uh, all right. Next up, there is a uh, a bug that is affecting some people who have a Radio Master TX12 and T8 Pro. And this bug is hitting them after they update the firmware of the multi protocol module. And then they're getting yes. a no telemetry problem where basically yes. their multi-protocol module stops working. You have identified the cause of the problem and a workaround. So if you are being yeah. affected by this or if you own a T8 Pro or TX12, listen up. 
Yeah, so um, uh, basically, uh, I, I just want to give credit. Bill Clark is the one who sent this to us and made a video on this. We've also linked in the show notes. Um, but basically, um, Radio Master put out uh, this radio, the T8, the T8 Pro and the TX12, um, and they used to use a different MCU. And that MCU version had to change because of shortages. Um, what they didn't realize when they changed this MCU was that that would affect things later um, and essentially creates this no telemetry bug. So mm -hmm. what they've done is they've made two new firmwares. Um, there's an option A firmware and an option B firmware. And depending on what you want to disable to, for now, you have to disable two protocols. Um, there's two different options. Um, yeah. And then you could reflash your MPM and it'll work all fine. Um, otherwise, you can wait. There's going to be another uh, update on the protocol module pretty soon. And then that firmware will have the full fix and all the protocol uh, versions will work. Um, and that will be so 1.3.2.93. All that is linked in the show notes. It sounds like there was maybe they, the, the new chip that they were using didn't have enough code space or something, memory. And they that's why they're leaving these protocols out just to make room. Um, yeah, something, yeah, somehow something got cut or doesn't fit or whatever. So. Um, Borked in the chat says, oh my God, I couldn't get a Express LRS to work and this was the error. Nice. Yeah, so typically no telemetry bug. Um, like if it's not this, then it's like you need to but you either need to flash edge TX to one bit mode um, on your QX7 uh, or mm -hmm. X9D plus or X10, or you need to do the crossfire inverter mod. Basically. Now you end up with this no telemetry problem, but you still can reflash, right? It's, it's not like locking you out. Is yes, that right? You can still okay. reflash. Yep. Yep. And these firmwares are what they recommend you reflash to, which is the current one. Um, I'm not sure if older firmwares will work properly or not um, because it's a new MCU. So I would probably oh, suggest just flashing to one of the ones they expect. Yeah, you may not be able to flash back to an old one because the old firmwares may not have support for this MCU. Wow. Okay. Well, um, apparently people are... Uh, more than one person in the chat has said they're affected by this. So check out the link in the video description either to Bill Clark. Thank you, Bill Clark, for the work. Uh, yeah. Bill Clark's video or to the Radio Master support page. There's a temporary fix now and a permanent fix is coming. Yep. Blonte, one of the coolest things about Edge TX and Open TX is the ability to run Lua scripts. And uh, a lot of people say, well, like, what is a Lua script? And it's basically just a program that you run on your radio that lets the radio do something without actually having to compile it into Open TX. Um, and one of the things people like to do is is use Lua scripts to configure their flight controller or to look at telemetry data. Um, but you've brought us a, a new Lua script called the Fly Me to the Moon Lua Toolbox. Uh, where yeah. do you want to start with the links here? Um, I would just open the first one there, just kind of maybe okay. breeze through that video a little bit. All right. Um, it's a pretty good, you get a pretty good view at around three minutes there of okay. like what the screen's going to look like. But basically... So, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Valenti. But, but basically, this uh, this is like a sort of like a master, like everything you could possibly want out of a Lua script um, to monitor your quad or do any changes or anything. So basically he wanted to combine everything together in a nice easy way um, to view everything. So this pulls everything in over telemetry it can. Otherwise you can assign like, so let's say you want to track the arm status, right? Mm -hmm. So arm status can either be tracked over telemetry or if you don't have telemetry for arm, uh, that arm switch can be tracked by switching it to a button. And then you can just tell a switch it position. your arm switch. Yeah. Interesting. So if you have like a complicated arming method where that isn't based on just one switch position, uh, you could just say, ask the flight controller whether it's armed. Correct. But yeah, if that's no. not working because you don't have telemetry, you could easily in the in the script say, well, you know what? Actually, just switch SF as my arm switch. That's how you know whether I'm armed. And the script just works either way. Yep. And then also, you know, so you're seeing all the telemetry is listed there on the side, so you have it easily accessible. Also, you see like horizon mode there, HR in the middle. Um, also, he's got like VTX status. So like if he puts VTX into pit mode or turns it off, that'll actually uh, go white. It's only black if the VTX is on. Um, hmm. There's just a lot of cool little features that I've never seen in a Lua script, and they're all compiled into one piece. Now, this is yeah. not 
uh, this is a lot of stuff, and this guy's working on this a lot. So this is not free, but it is only $5, and there is a free version if you want to try it um, that's a little bit more limited. So it's not going to have like the VTX info. Um, there's no stick command module. So this actually gives you a list of stick commands if you forget them. Oh, wow. Um, there's, there's it's, a got a throttle, it's got a throttle limit on a potentiometer, which is something you can set up just in OpenTX mixing. But here it's making it super easy to do just yeah, through the script. A, Exactly. He's taken a bunch of these things that like most pilots would want to do, and then he's put them into a much easier ways to map them out. So, um, yeah, pretty pretty neat little thing. And like I said, $5 one-time purchase. He's constantly updating this. Um, you'll get it forever if you buy it for 5 bucks, um, Or you can use the light version with some missing features, um, but it still has a lot of stuff in it um, for free. And we've got all those links down in the show notes. This is Fly Me to the Moon. Wow. Really cool. Really cool. Uh, here's some configuration stuff, radio configure. Basically, it's almost like he's reskinning OpenTX. I because agree, there's, yeah. Because there's, there's stuff here that is radio stuff, set up stuff in the radio, but OpenTX has kind of a crappy interface that bugs some people. And he's giving you a single interface that lets you manage both the radio and the quadcopter at the same time. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, this could be the next version of OpenTX, except it won't be. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, and so this supports, like you can see it's running on Freedom TX right now. Um, so he's got it running on Freedom TX, Open TX, Edge TX, and then also the Nirvana has support, uh, f like formatted for the Nirvana. He's also working on color and touch, I believe. Um, so yeah, it's all, it's pretty cool, this, man. This, this is a neat project. This has to have been so much work. Like, uh, yes. like five yeah. bucks is, forget it, forget about it. Oh, this is Edge TX, I think. It looks like Edge TX. Yeah, crazy, crazy. And the um, other cool thing here is that he's mentioned that, like, the way he built this out, um, all the GUIs are, like, super easy for him to change around. So as new radios come out, he should just be able to format them quickly. He said it basically took him, like, 15 minutes to get the Nirvana working from, you know, the other versions. So pretty cool. Yeah, nice, nice. Uh, yeah, five bucks is, is, is nothing compared to the amount of time it would take to build some of this stuff. This has to have been a labor of love. So uh, there is a link in the video description uh, to this if you want to check it out. And thank you so much to um, Robert Genis. I can't pronounce Polish names. Thanks so much to Robert. Yes. <laughs> for the work much he's done there. Yes. Uh, yeah. All right. Great. Um, uh, next up, Blunty, we have a very quick tool here. Uh, yes, last week or the week before, we did a bunch of, uh, I asked for a tool that would let me uh, manipulate a DJI subtitle file, like to get rid of information and uh, so forth. And that triggered people sending in a whole bunch of tools for analyzing and manipulating these DJI SRT files. Uh, and without taking away anything from the people who we've already showed, this one that I received this week may be one of the most impressive ones. This is the SRT parser for DJI video from uh, Sven de Boek. Bo Bo Not sure how to pronounce that diphthong, but... Um, and basically, it lets you import video and SRT. And then not only can you play them back together, but it also lets you look at the the individual graphs of all the individual stuff you can turn them on or off um we can manipulate them uh it is a downloadable tool available for windows 10 only it's not an online tool so um does it have the ability to export does can it do the well, the one thing i did ask which was the ability to get rid of some of the items and export the new srt file I'm not thinking. Oh uh, yeah, right. Yeah, you can right-click that chart data once you've selected to export. Okay. But this is a really great tool because just getting that SRT into like Excel is non-trivial. I mean, if you if you know how to program Python, it's trivial, but um, it's non-trivial. So this is a great tool to let you look at things like your signal strength graph and so forth. Uh, we've seen other tools that do similar things. Uh, we've talked about them in previous weeks, but this one is certainly worthy uh it's the first one i've seen that lets you actually look at the video in real time i think so yeah really slick yep all right got that uh what next blunty got another quick little segment here and a quick nod to halo rc 
Um, Halo RC has been a UK only website for a while. Over there, make some neat little frames. Mm. Um, and uh, I think mainly the one that most people uh, talk about is like the Halo RC R Cyrus or the Guitar Pick. Mm -hmm. um, and those are now available in a US warehouse. So now you can select US, buy in USD, and order from the US. And of course, the main obviously buying in usd is nice but this is going to save you shipping is the bottom line uh, yes. I, I i considered this frame for my perfect freestyle build and in the end i went a different direction but this is a very very good frame if you're trying to build a 700 gram freestyle or i'm talking about the osiris there are, it's not his only frame if you're trying to build like a 700 gram a 670 gram freestyle frame uh this is a great choice it's surprisingly durable given how little carbon it has. Uh, but if you if you were in the USA, uh, the shipping would really kill you. Uh, so now he's got a USA warehouse. We just want to point that out. Um, cool. All right. And other new stuff. Uh, one of the cool things we've shown here before that I think a lot of people really, really dig are these uh, folding TPU receiver holders. We've looked at a few of them from Mr. Ridwan Yu, the license to drive. And mm -hmm. uh, he has now done one for the EP2 that covers the ceramic antenna. So pretty, pretty snazzy. Yeah. These are really nice because they print flat. So you don't need to have any, like even if your printer is not running that great, you don't have to do overhangs. You don't have to do anything complicated. They just print flat, just like you see them here. And then they fold over the receiver. So he's designed to be really easy to print um and it, they sort of simultaneously mount your receiver and also protect it from like electronic problems as far as weight goes it's probably a little heavier than just like some heat shrink and a zip tie or maybe some tape but um i like i really like this for mounting receivers on top of the the, the vista it can be really hard to get uh, a receiver to stay on top of the vista there's not really a great place to put the zip ties where it won't get in the way of the usb but the Vista has these 20 millimeter mounting screws and, and it's a great way to mount it. So, yeah. Yeah. Daytona FPV says, nice of them to be stealing off of Thingiverse. I think you're confused, Daytona. Those files on Thingiverse were created by this guy. He didn't steal them. He he made them. They're yep. his. Licensed to Drive yeah, invented yeah, these. Haku, Haku 3D is licensed to drive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no one stole them. So take take simmer down, simmer down. Now, Sec101 right. asks, and this is a common question, Blunty, uh, what about heat? Isn't the TPU going to trap heat and make the receiver, like, overheat? Yes. Uh, however... Um, okay, yes, was... it will. That's the answer. No. Yes, oh, it sorry. Was, you were... it, was, it was tested, though, if you, like, compare it to, like, a Crossfire Nano or something. It looks like um, anywhere from, like, 45 to 50C is all they're getting to, which isn't that bad for electronic components. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. The one so, thing you do have to be concerned about is uh, Wi-Fi mode. So when these things go into Wi-Fi mode, they're hot as shit. Like it's like 90C or something like that inside the TPU. Mm -hmm. um, he was testing it. So mm -hmm. the main thing you've got to watch out for is having these things just sitting in Wi-Fi mode. But once you've bound them and you've got your radio set up, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. So. Okay. All right. So that's if you're. It does add some heat, but for most receivers, it's not a big deal. However, the Express LRS receivers that go into Wi-Fi mode will generate even 90C. 90C is like, that's not enough to melt the TPU. I know that for a fact because I print TPU. TPU prints at like 200, 230, uh, up to 230, but certainly not below about 200. So it's not going to melt the TPU. And frankly, 90C is like, it's not great for electronics, but that's still, that's like where your CPU will throttle at about 90C. So it's probably yeah. not going to hurt anything even at 90C, although you, you still wouldn't want to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, License to Drive says he stopped the test after four minutes because it got to 85 Celsius, which is where you can start to soften TPU. So it could have gotten hotter, I guess is what he's saying. We don't know that it'll level out at 90C. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So just be aware of that, I guess, is the limitation. Um. One IFPV says I used a folding TPU mount for my Crossfire Nano module, but I regretted it because I couldn't access the bind button. Uh, I think License to Drive has taken that into account, though. He has taken into account access to the module of some way, in some way. Pretty sure. Um, 
And thank you to Presmo C for a 10 a Polish slutty, I think they are. Uh, he says, fly me to the moon is pronounced Robert Yeniszewski. Yeniszewski. All right, great. Uh, let me just get Robocop FPV as well with a $5 super chat. Vincent Chase is my cousin. I can have him talk to super agent Ari Gold and see if he'll rep you guys for flow state if you're interested. All right. Sh sure. Anybody yeah. who wants to buy it. <laughs> Anybody who wants to show it. I think I know, mean, like at a festival. We have we have one guy who said, "Hey, he has he's he says connections and he's interested in repping it." Uh, but I feel like, you know, we we would at least we don't have a contract signed with anybody and I feel like at least uh talking to people is, you know, why say no? I don't really who yeah, have Ari Gold call me. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I mean, hey, 10% is 10%, right? Uh, is it a joke? Or is it, am I being trolled right now? It's an entourage joke. I see. I'm sorry. I thought it was a sincere offer. I'm just that that gullible. I didn't watch Entourage, so I missed the joke. All right. Well, anyway, yeah. I'm a loser. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Time for the rants, Blunty. Do you yes. want to go? We have them in me first, then you. Do you want to go first, or do you think I should go first? Um, I'm open. I don't know. They they both fit into each other, so it doesn't really matter. I don't think. Okay. Um, my rant is that I want the Express LRS devs to give me S bus output on an Express LRS receiver, and here's why I say that. I don't care. I just all my flight controllers have plenty of TX and RX pads, but there are rare flight controllers out there, especially micros, like little 16 millimeter or all-in-ones that only have like an S-Bus pad, like especially on Tiny Whoops, which is where Express LRS excels. Tiny, tiny little receivers, great for Tiny Whoops. Your Tiny Whoop only has an S-Bus pad. F you, you can't use Express LRS. Why won't they do it, Blunty? Yeah, I don't, well, so, um... From my recent conversations with the devs, it seems like uh, essentially supporting it is letting it continue. You know, that that's like kind of what they say. Um, this sort mm -hmm. of leads into what I'm going to talk about, which is, you know, um, essentially it's up to the, the, the manufacturer of the board to decide what to put on the board and to decide the spacing of the board and the layout of the board. And so their argument is essentially like, why should we support our, our old hardware? Why should we support inverters? Why should we support designs that are made because of the other poor solutions we had in the industry? And instead, um, you know, why, yeah, why should we do that? Why should we just like let that die? Like if we don't support inverters and people continue okay. to not support inverters, wouldn't inverters die? So here's the counter. I mean, I think the counter argument to that is that until Express LRS is as or more popular than FreeSky, flight controllers will come with S bus is just the de facto standard, especially for very small flight controllers. Now, you know, you, the way that Express LRS can make that change is to become more popular than FreeSky. But until that happens, the, the and we've seen this same argument with the beta flight devs and I, I understand the counter argument the beta flight devs have been asked like why won't they fix the problem with dji warning osd element and the beta flight devs say look the way they're doing it is wrong we're not going to kludge our software up to support it right but it doesn't feel the same to me. SBUS is just a protocol that a lot of different receivers use, not just FreeSky. Futaba made it originally. FreeSky uses it. FlySky uses it. You can even get DSMX receivers that output SBUS. It's just a standard protocol. And I guess I'm like, well, how hard would it be just to put it in the firmware? Come on, coders. How hard could it be? <laughs> I'm sure nobody's going to be upset about that. Um, yeah, just yeah. get just get on it. What? Yeah, no, I think th I understand where you're coming from. I just think that, like I also get the other point, and so I guess let's lead that into my rant, which okay. is my all right. My problem with this is like, why do we have to deal with this? Like, there's no reason, especially on a thirty by thirty, but like even on smaller boards, 
not to give me some way to connect to the other pins of your MCU so that I can use the UART that could be there. Like if you only map me an RX4 and you could have given me a TX4 and you have enough pins on the MCU and you made a decision not to do that. To right. me, like that's a conscious decision. You could have split a pad in half and made yeah. two half size pads or three quarter yeah. size pads, you know, whatever. Put a dot on there that, that's normally used for uh, like jigging or whatever. And I could just mm -hmm. solder a little dot. But anything that gives me the ability to use my full FC that I have purchased on the full MCU on it, I yeah. feel like is positive. That's like, look at this, saying. look at this flight controller. Look at this asinine design. Are you ready? <laughs> yes, I'm ready. All right. Look at this. This guy, <laughs> we got a T6 and an R6. Good. We got UART6 ready to go. We got a T4 and an R4. Good. UART4 ready to go. Except UART4 is also used for ESC telemetry. So if you're doing ESC telemetry, this UART is borked. These pads are useless. So good luck with your smart audio. Can't do that. Well, Andy. Hey. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna say like that's not the worst in the world because at least you also provided the TX4 in case you didn't use, you know, ESC telemetry. Now here we've got S bus, which is UART one with an inverter. However, the inverter is switchable, so you could use this as a generic UART one pad. But there is no TX one. There's only RX one. And then here we've got telemetry, which is UART three TX with an inverter that you can't switch off. So basically, this is good for smart port and nothing else. Jesus, like what were they thinking? Who designed this flight controller? Some, some guy named Bardwell. Sheesh. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know. I think that's also a reasonable thing to ask for is like start considering in these designs like where you can provide us a full UART, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe there's even like, okay, the, the, this may sound crazy and you already don't have room on the flight controller, but if you really only have room for one pad up top, why don't you hide like a little jumper on the bottom so mm -hmm. that like I can jump away from it or like this can be TX1, but also we could just give you TX2 so you have a full UR. I don't know, there's so yeah. many choices. Yeah. And then I could solder to those little jumper spots and then I could use mm -hmm. both of them. Like, yeah. There's just so many I mean, reasons, I think. Bo yeah. Board space is the answer that people would reply with. They would say, well, yeah. we needed, we only had so much room for pads and we didn't want to add complexity. But the, like, the JBF4 was very similar in design to the SP Racing F4. Uh, that was intentional. Uh, I don't remember the exact business details, but it was done with Chen Ling, the designer of the CL Racing F4. It was done with his cooperation. Um, and the CL Racing has on the underside two little tiny TX1 and TX whatever. They they put the pads there if you want them. Why didn't I don't know why the JBF4 didn't do that. I don't know. This was it yeah. was a long time ago. We we were thinking differently. We thought we were ahead of the game by giving you all these pads. Well the JBF7 has got all the pads you want. Oh well that's funny that you mentioned that because this <laughs> when when I helped we designed the JBF7 from scratch. The JBF4 had already had a basic layout done by the time I brought I was brought on board, but when I designed the JBF7, I said, "Look, I want I, I'm only going to do this if I can do it from scratch exactly how I want it," and I basically just said, "Give me every UART, everyone," and for the most part, we got it. Although uh, you can't use SDA, SCL, and T3R3 at the same time, but there you go. Um, yeah, so I'm happy about that. And on the underside, we got. Wait, that's the other thing, Bunty. Rant number three. Whenever there's a plug, break the damn pads out somewhere so I can get at them if I need to. Didn't I, I agree with you unless it's like a choice. Unless you're like, I don't know. If you don't have room on the board and you have mm -hmm. to put it in a plug, I'd rather have it in a plug than nowhere. Yeah, like a, but, true. But also, I agree with you. It would be nice to have it also broken up. Yeah. I like, uh, that's one thing we've looked at before is that um, the Dominic Clifton, the... Mm -hmm. The new board he's got, the H7, has snap-off yeah. pads. So if you want to solder the mm -hmm. pads, you have them. If you want to snap off and solder to the sides or not have them, you can also do that. He's a smart man, that Dominic Clifton. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Josh Lab, for a $5 Australian super chat. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, we got a couple comments from ExpressLRS devs. Hey, ExpressLRS devs, this is the rant section. Please don't take it too seriously. <laughs> this is just where we go off the cuff and yell. We, we, we both understand, you probably more than me, Blunty, because you're actually, you know, really active in the Express LRS Discord and talk to the devs. It's a lot of work, and you guys are donating your time for free, and it's always annoying when someone just whines, but that's the point. Um, Captain Barry says, 
Raphael Koafik was working toward SBUS output, but he started Edge TX, and you'll have to get him to do it because none of us have time for it. I would rather his development time be spent on Edge TX than SBUS. He also points out that internally they're really tightly wrapped around the Crossfire protocol, so just switch to SBUS on the output side would not be trivial. Um, he also points out that you'd be limited to 100 hertz, which the whole one of the whole points of Express LRS is high performance. Uh, and SBUS couldn't do it. I guess you could do fast SBUS. How fast is fast SBUS? Is that 100 hertz? I don't know. I don't know. Um, so, so, uh, thank you, Express Lars Devs. Um, yeah. I guess the real rant, have plenty. Let's change the rant. Flight controller <laughs> manufacturers, stop using SBUS. Yeah, 100 There we go. That's a good Can rant. We just I like that rant. Kill yeah. the F4. Or if you're yes. going to use an F4, don't put SBUS on there. They'll never do that, though. Yeah, or give me the option and give me the full UART somewhere. That's fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm fine with that. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Got that out of the way. There'll never be a problem yes. again. And that is going to bring <laughs> us to the end of the news. Uh, yes. Thank you so much, Blunty. It's been good seeing yeah. you again. I will not see you next week. As a reminder, everybody, we'll yeah. be off next week because I'm out of town. Uh, and uh, I'll Maybe. be back the week after. Maybe an update for anybody who's curious what other streams we miss. So you so you won't do Sunday, Monday, or Correct. Tuesday. Correct. I'll, I'll be on the playa, presumably. I mean, it's possible we'll get out to the playa and go, this is nonsense and leave. I don't think so. But it's possible I'll be in civilization over the weekend. But it's likely I'll be completely out of touch over the weekend. So. All right. Um, All right. So if you have any news for two weeks from now, you can email that to news at fpvknowitall.com. I always have that on the screen for if you forget the email address you can go to any web any live stream and look right at the bottom um and then also uh subscribe to this channel uh, like Definitely. this channel and comment down at the bottom once this is up and yeah. we would appreciate it so great thank you so much uh dbfpv thanks for a five dollar super chat any hope for more nebula nano pros yes caddix says they're coming caddix was originally saying that they were coming in august I, I know people who have orders in with Caddx. So this is not just Caddx. This is Caddx telling people who have given them lots of money to buy Nebula Pros when they will receive their product. So this is a little bit more yep. solid than just, you know, public statements. And they started saying end of August and now they're saying end of September. Yeah, mid to late September <laughs> is still that time frame that I'm here. So. And who knows if when the mid to late September comes, they'll say October. We just don't know. Yep. It's about Absolutely. Late. And then also we've got uh just run cam on the horizon too they uh that does look to be confirmed because they added a picture of their camera with the air unit on their page so hopefully we'll see some information from them soon yeah run cam selling the mippy with it with uh is it gonna be like a run cam vtx uh yeah it's just uh, like a, a run cam air unit was like yeah. the idea yeah similar yeah. to the caddx air unit People in the chat are saying it didn't seem like we had two distinct rants, Blunty, but it was just one big rant. They they flowed into each other. My yes. rant was can my rant was the flight controller only supports S bus, so can't we have S bus output from an Express LRS? And your yes. rant was was to give me the, all the UARTs so we can use whatever we want and stop forcing me into using S bus. Yeah, no, Blunty did not get hushed. You you said your rant, <laughs> which was. Yes, was which was maybe it's not the you agreed with the express lrs devs that it's not their problem to solve it's the flight controller problem to solve that was your brand yeah okay yeah all right well we're gonna let that go and we're gonna finish up for tonight thank you so much blunty thank you guys so much we'll see you in two weeks uh yes. have a great night everybody take it easy all right